Amen, amen. It's all coming. How are we doing tonight? Oh, all right. Hey, this is my crew of people right here. I love you guys a lot. I uh, heard there's a big crosstown rivalry this week, University of Dubuque, Loris. Anybody going to be at that? Oh, hey, yeah, we got, we got a little UD football around here. Uh, I won't say who I'm rooting for, but uh, go Dubuque. Uh, if you guys are walking in the doors today and you're like, man, this is my first time, or maybe you've been coming for a bit, and you're like, man, do I have to clean myself up before I walk in those doors? I just want you to know, man, you're, you're welcome through those doors, and I hope you experience the goodness of Jesus Christ tonight through his word. Um, <clears throat> we're finishing up a series that's called The Adventures in Babylon. So we've been working through the book of Daniel, and Daniel is writing in the 6th century B.C., and what happened was Israel, God's chosen people, has been exiled from their, from their home nation and has been transported to Babylon. And Daniel, he's writing this letter over a course of 70 years. And he's writing to the Israelites saying, be encouraged. God is at work. We await a better king and a better kingdom. And tonight we're going to see that Daniel, he's teaching us how to plead the promises of God. He's just pleading with God his promises through prayer. Sorry, I saw a bunch of deaf. Um, And so that's where we're going tonight. And man, this passage came to life for me this week. You know, sometimes it's, it's hard, it's kind of a hard scripture But on Sunday night, I got a text message about two college students in Iowa City that got in an ATV accident, and they're part part of a salt company there. And I heard just uh, one of the students was being life-flighted to the university hospital. And so my mind starts running, uh, heard spinal cord, head, shoulder, knee injuries, not knowing the state that he's in. And the other student was uh, one of my former youth students for four years, and just a young man that I just loved to death, and just a dude that I've, I've walked with and seen God work in his life. And uh, I, I met up with him the next day, and he was just clearly shaken. Like, he was just shaken. And he was just describing to me the scariest experience of his life where they were on an ATV and was taking a a turn too quickly and it ejected uh, the young man from the ATV and then the ATV continued to roll over on top of him, um, pinning him underneath the ATV. And this young man, he was just describing to me just the agony of, of trying to curl up this ATV but just the excruciating pain that it was causing. And so he put the the crossbars of the ATV on his back and and calf raised for what he said to be like 10 minutes. And he's like, it it is like three times the weight that I could ever, ever lift. And they were just crying out, like screaming for, for someone to come and help. And after a while, he said, they just started praying. They just, they didn't know what to do. They just started praying like, God, act. Like, God, show up. God, like, bring help. Heal us. God, like, act right now. And they were just pleading, like, pleading with God, like, show up. And and the young man, he was telling me, he's like, after about 10 minutes, he was at the point where he was just about to pass out. Like, he, he couldn't hold this anymore. And around the corner comes three friends on a, on a little go-kart and help get the ATV up get him stabilized, they put him in an ambulance, and then they end up life flighting him to the U, and while we were hanging out Monday afternoon, he got a phone call from this young man, and this young man was just like, hey, I'm going to be all right, like I'm going to make a 100% recovery by this spring, and he's just like, be at peace, be at peace. And my former U student, he was just looking at me, and he was like, God spared us. Like, there is no way of describing this, but, like, God showed up. Like, we had no way of describing, of lifting this, that he's okay. 
And he just looked at me, and he had tears in his eyes, and I had tears in my eyes, and he was just reveling in the mercy of God, just God being so merciful. In Daniel tonight, we're going to see that he's pleading to God on the basis of mercy. He's like, God, show up. And I think so frequently, we don't actually believe in the power of prayer until our life depends on it. But what if this was a group of people who our lives depended on prayer daily? Like we prayed with this kind of urgency for God to show up and to act and to forgive and to hear. I think we would see God at work in ways we would not be able to describe except God being merciful and God acting. And so we're going to be in Daniel chapter 9. Uh, if you have your Bible, you can open it up. It's also on the screen. And it starts like this. It says, In the first year of Darius, the son of, I don't know how to say this guy's name, Ahasuerus. Anybody got any better guesses than that? I don't know. It's a 6th century B.C. name. A Mede by birth, who was made king over the Chaldean kingdom, in the first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood from the books according to the word of the Lord to the prophet Jeremiah that the number of years for the desolation of Jerusalem would be 70. And so here's what's going on. Daniel has been in exile for, for what's coming up on seven decades. All right, this book isn't written in like seven months. This is over seven decades. And so I want, want to kind of illustrate this. What would it be like if you were living in a foreign nation since 1952, all right, 1952, and now you are returning to your home nation. Here's what's happened from 1952 until now. Well, we, we finished up World War II, um, and things that have came into existence since then, uh, space travel, uh, that's a pretty big one. Uh, another one would be the microwave oven for all of your popcorn. Uh, the personal computer, they, they, you know, computers have came out. Email, uh, Apple, and, and not the Apple to eat, but the Apple to rule the world. And so Daniel and, and the chosen people, the Israelites, they've been gone for, for 68 years now, and life has gone on. And I'm sure they've grown accustomed to life in exile. And, and you think about 68 years, probably many people have died physically not returning to their homeland. And then a lot of people would have been born, and that's all they would have known is life in Babylon as exiles. And so we see that, that Daniel, he's bringing together Israel. And he's saying something like, prepare yourself. All right, remember the character of God, confess your disobedience, and seek God to act for his glory. And so he's going to scripture, he's, he's quoting Jeremiah 25, where the Lord, he says, for 70 years I'll bring desolation on Jerusalem, but then he's going to have mercy and he's going to restore his people. So he's coming, and, and scripture is his stimulus to pray. But we pick up in verse 3, and this is going to go through verse 14, and it's going to seem pretty long. But, but I kind of want the, the, the tone of Daniel to come forth. And, and here's what it says. It says, So I turn to the Lord God to seek him by prayer and petitions with fasting, sackcloth, and ashes. I prayed to the Lord my God and confessed, Ah, oh, Lord, the great and awe-inspiring God who keeps his gracious covenant with those who love him and keep his commands. We... We, Israel, we have sinned. We have done wrong. We have acted wickedly, rebelled, and turned away from your commands and ordinances. We have not listened to your servants, the prophets who spoke in your name, to our kings, leaders, ancestors, and all of the people of the land. And Lord, righteousness, righteousness belongs to you. But this day, public shame actually belongs to us the men of Judah, the residents of Jerusalem, and all of Israel, those who are near and those who are far in all the countries where you have banished them because of this, the disloyalty they've shown toward you. Again, he's saying, Lord, public shame belongs to us, 
to our kings, to our leaders and our ancestors because we, we have sinned against you. But what does he say about the Lord here in verse nine? He says, compassion and forgiveness belong to the Lord our God. Though we have rebelled against him and we have not obeyed the Lord our God by following his instructions that he set before us through his servants, the prophets. And he keeps going, I'm telling you, it's kind of long, but he continues to just confess. He says, all of Israel has broken your law and turned away, refusing to obey you. The promised curse written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, has been poured out on us because we have sinned against him. And he has carried out his words that he spoke against us and against our rulers by bringing on us a disaster that is so great that nothing like it has been done to Jerusalem has ever been done under all of heaven. And he keeps going, just as is written in the law of Moses, all this disaster has come on us, yet. He's saying, we deserved this disaster by not obeying God's law, yet. We did not turn from our iniquities and pay attention to your truth. So the Lord in his steadfast character kept a disaster in mind and brought it on us for the Lord our God is righteous in all he has done, but we have not obeyed him. All right, kind of long, right? It's, it's a long prayer, but he's, he's just pouring out his heart. He's bringing these people together and pouring it out. So tonight we're gonna have three observations on how Daniel pleads the promises of God. All right, how does Daniel plead the promises of God in the sixth century BC? And the first one is adoration. How does Daniel begin his prayer? It's adoration. Right, he's saying like, Lord, you're great and you're compassionate, you're unchanging and you're true to your promises right away in verse four. That's what he's saying. Is like before he prays, he starts with, Lord, you are great and you are awe-inspiring. And so he confesses what's true about God. And, and why does he do this? Because he understands the character of God is not inconsistent, right? God is unchanging in his nature, and though he is just in his wrath, he also knows that God is gracious with his covenant people. And the promised, uh, promised curse of written in the law of Moses has been fulfilled, yet Daniel, he knows God and his character. And so this begs the question of how do you know someone? Like, how do you know what someone is like. If someone were to ask you, hey, what is Austin like? My name's Austin, if you didn't know me. My name's Austin. So someone would be like, hey, what's Austin like? And I don't know if I've ever met you. What's your name? Drew. Drew, nice to meet you, man. And you were like Carter and you guys, you guys were gonna go in that whiteboard and you were just gonna write down, here's what Austin is like. And so you just start jotting some, some some notes down to Drew on what Austin's like, and you're like, well, Austin, he's a, uh, he's, has brown hair. He is the average height of American males. He has a mustache for Movember. Uh, anybody else with me this month? Alex, Link, a couple people, all right, he has a mustache. Uh, he's not too funny. You know, but a couple jokes land once in a while, but, he, you know, overarching, he's not a very funny guy. He, uh, he definitely outkicked his coverage when it came to marriage with Ellie. Uh, that one, he, he definitely outdid himself. And he has a below average vocal range, and he likes to eat barbecue, right? These would be descriptions of what Austin is like, but if you were to never have spent time with me, would you really know me? No. So how do you really get to know someone? Right? One, you probably have to spend time with them. Two, you probably have to talk with them. Three, you gotta listen, with, listen to them, you gotta observe them. And so this begs the question, to know God, you must spend time with God. Right? To know God, you must spend time with God. And to spend time with God, you must make time for God. And so when someone asks you, what is God like? You're not going to a whiteboard and being like, well, I know God from Sunday school. 
here's what's true about him. He did this in, in the book of Exodus. But you know God from a place of intimacy. We're like, let me tell you how God has actually been great and awe-inspiring in my life. Let me actually tell you how God has been slow to anger with me when I deserved just quick anger. Let me tell you how God has actually been compassionate and and gracious to me. How how God has actually been a father to me and I have been his child. How he has been a friend to me in trials. How he has been a rock and a refuge for me in unstable times. What is God like? We have to spend time with God. And we see this in Daniel. Daniel, he adores God. He's like, God, here's who you are. And he has spent time with God. And so I want to make this really practical, right? A a really practical sermon where you're like, man, what, what do I take away? A great prayer rhythm tomorrow morning to start a prayer is just write three, three true things about God. Three truth claims about God. So this morning what I did is I wrote these three, three things down. I said, God is good. All right, really low-hanging fruit. God is good. And then I wrote, God is faithful. And then the third one I wrote, God is unchanging. And what I did is I, I just started praying from that place. Like, God, you are good. Lord, you are faithful to me when I am not faithful. Lord, you are unchanging. And what this does is it, it postures our hearts of saying, God, here's, who, here's what's true about you. And the second observation we see from here is confession. All right, the bulk of this is confession, where he's just saying, like, Lord, we've gone wrong. All right, we've gr- gone wrong. We're sorry for the mess that we've made. And like I I mentioned earlier, I'm married to my wife, Ellie. We've been married for a couple years now. And our first year of marriage, she wanted to have a pretty serious conversation after dinner. And so I was like, all right, I'll have a pretty serious conversation after dinner. And uh, she sat me down on the couch and she opened up her laptop. And my dear wife put together a PowerPoint titled, why We Should Get a Dog by Ellie Claver. And I was a sucker, and so turning to this, this winter is, this is our dog, Franklin. Yeah, this is our big goofball, Franklin, and he's a big, gentle giant. Um, and we ooh and ah now, but let me tell you about when, when Franklin was a puppy, all right? Franklin went through a notorious phase which I called shark mode, and... I want to kind of set the scene here. I, you know, working really hard all day, and it's a cold, dark winter night, and I come home, and my puppy Franklin, where we're like, oh, he's really cute, he has toilet paper spread all the way throughout our apartment, and so I come home, and Franklin has taken toilet paper, and he would proceed to run the entire thing through our apartment. And so if that wasn't enough, I come home and Franklin has not only destroyed our toilet paper, but he has destroyed my favorite books. Uh, This is a special edition of C.S. Lewis's The Great Divorce, Herman Boving's The Wonderful Works of God. Um, And if that weren't enough, if toilet paper and books weren't enough, I I come home another night and Franklin has devoured a two-foot diameter in our carpet, uh, literally down to the subfloor, and no idea. And if toilet paper and if books and the carpet weren't enough, I come home one night, and he has literally ate through our wall. All right, he has ate through the drywall. And what was running through my head is why we should get a dog. Um, but now. Imagine if I were to come home to Franklin and I were to come before him and be like, Franklin, who did this? And in a little personified, like, old man puppy voice, like, oh, not me. Like, it wasn't me. It was the other guy. Right? What? <laughs> what would we say? Like, you have made a mess 
of what was entrusted to you, Franklin. Like you had freedom in my trust and you've squandered it. And here in the book of Daniel, here's where it connects to the scriptures. Daniel doesn't hold back in describing the failures, failures of Israel. He, he's, for the most part of this, this scripture, he's just laying out the failures of the people. And, and why does he do this? Why does he do this? Because he knows God was just in his wrath and his judgment on Israel. Right? He, he knows how God has brought them out of the land of Egypt after 430 years of being exiled there. He has brought them through the sea. He has made them this covenant people. He has been steadfast and he's been faithful with them. But he's recounting to this group of young men that are growing up and young women. And he's bringing in all of these old geezers that have been in exile. And he's bringing them together and he's reminding them of their history. And, and he's saying, the Lord has been faithful to us. But we see that our ancestors and we see that we ourselves have been disobedient. That we actually haven't trusted the promises of God and therefore God in his just anger actually delivered us over. But what he's doing is he's coming and he's pleading that God would be gracious and he'd be compassionate to bring them out of exile. And Jesus, he describes his heart posture. I love when Jesus teaches because he just like penetrates your heart. Um, If you're like, man, I've never read the Bible and I want to read the Bible, just read the book of Matthew and you're just going to be like, wow, really Jesus does this and he says this? But he, in Luke 18, he, he describes two men who are entering into the temple. And one is a Pharisee. And a Pharisee in the first century would be this really religious figure, someone who's, who's high esteemed and one people would commend for really following the law and having it together. And, and the other one is a tax collector. And amongst the Jews in the first century, tax collectors would be like the bottom of the totem pole, all right? They'd be the people that would walk into the temple and be like, you're, you're in the temple? Really a tax collector? And here's what Jesus has to describe. He describes how they're praying. And it says the Pharisee, he comes in, and this is what he prays like. He says, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. Right, God, I'm I'm thankful that I'm not greedy, Lord, that I'm not unrighteous or adulterous or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of everything I get. And so you have this vision of this Pharisee. And then he talks about the tax collector. And this is what the tax collector is seen doing. It says, far off, he would not even look up to heaven, right? He's like on the ground, and it says he's striking his chest, and he's just saying, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And here's what Jesus has to say about these two different postures. He says, I tell you, this one went down to his house justified, rather than the other, because everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. And so, Salt Company, when God looks into your life, all right, here's where we take it from like an illustration to an explanation to like application. When God looks into your life, where does he see a mess that you've made? Where where he's entrusted you with something, and, and he sees a mess that you've made. Maybe it's uh, just a low to high grade guilt of how you've hurt someone. We're just like, man, like the Lord looks into my life and he sees this. Or, or maybe it's just a, an addiction. You, you just can't seem to, to break. Or maybe it's just every time I take a test, I just have this tendency that I have to cheat. Like, I just kind of let my conscience go and I I just kind of cheat. Or maybe it's just trivial lies of making yourself seem more impressive in a social environment. Or or envying what others have, wishing you had what they had, or wishing they didn't have what they had. And God's not fooled, right? Sometimes we feel like we can fool God, but like, what, me? Me? oh no, like it was the other guy. Like, no, it wasn't me. And we can do this thing where we actually act like we're void. 
of any mess. And what God is showing is the heart posture of just saying, like, Lord, I see what I've done. Like, I, I know the mercy that I need for my life. And here's how I responded to Franklin. I walked in and I just, bad dog, <laughs> right? Like, you know, any self-control just goes out the door when, when that happens, especially my books. I'm like, eat my carpet book, my favorite books. And so my human nature is just like, bad dog, why did you do this? And we cuddled eventually, it's fine. But here's what he's saying is God actually doesn't respond like that. He's saying, God, actually forgiveness and compassion belong to you. Saying, yeah, you're just in in our punishment, but what he's doing is he's pleading, saying, like, God actually deals with his people when we plead out of humility with compassion. With compassion. And so applicability number two is if we start with three characteristics about God. All right, God, you're good. God, you're faithful. God, you're unchanging. Maybe tomorrow morning in in your time of prayer, you can just write two ways in which you've fallen short or you just need God's help. And this morning, one that I wrote was just like, God, help me with this desire of walking into every single room I'm in and trying to be a big deal, right? Like, God, help me with this like pride in me that desires to be a big deal. Like, rid that from my life, God. I, I know it's destructive, Another one is just envy. Like, God, help me just be content with what I have, like what you've given me, and not have to desire what everyone else has. And so maybe, maybe that looks different for you guys, but tomorrow morning, just write down, like, God, here's, who, here's what's true about you, and then, Lord, here's where I've seen myself fall short. And then we're going to finish up in verses 16 through 19. Where it says, Lord, in keeping with all of your righteous acts, may your anger and wrath turn away from your city, Jerusalem, your holy mountain. For because of our sins and the iniquities of our ancestors, Jerusalem and your people have become an object of ridicule to all of those around us. All right? Israel is an object of ridicule. Therefore, all right, therefore, here, here's where he hones in. He says, therefore, our God, hear the prayer and the petitions of your servant." Make your face shine on the desolate sanctuary for the Lord's sake. Listen closely, my God, and hear. Open your eyes and see our desolations in the city that bears your name. And look at this verse. He says, for we are not presenting our petitions before you based on our righteous acts, but based on your abundant compassion. And he ends saying, Lord, hear. Lord, forgive. Lord, listen and act. My God, for your own sake, do not delay because your city and your people bear your name. The last part that he has is supplication. Supplications where he's just saying, Lord, like in light of who you are, in light of my shortcomings, Lord, hear. Lord, forgive. Lord, listen. Lord, act. Not for my sake, not for my comfort, but Lord, for your name's sake. And he's like a beggar coming before a king, Daniel pleading on the basis of God's mercy. Lord, act. So Saul Company, what if we prayed like this? What if we actually pleaded like our lives depended on it? That, that we prayed like our lives depended on it every single day, Lord, hear us. Lord, act. And as we close the book of Daniel, we saw that Daniel was writing to this people. And he's saying, we await a better king and a better kingdom. Or he's like, we live in exile and we wait for a better king and a better kingdom. And Christian, if you're in the room and you're Christian, here's the good news, is we have seen our king come on earth. We have seen him bring his kingdom, continue to bring his kingdom, and we know his kingdom will come in full, and that's in the person of Jesus Christ. And when he shows up and he sees the mess that we've made of our lives, and and, and the, the brokenness, the rebellion of our hearts, He actually wears that upon himself on the cross. 
When he's saying, God, you are compassionate and gracious, what we actually see is God taking on human form to die on a cross, to, to wear the mess we've made to t- come in our place. And the hope that we have tonight is that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. He is risen from the dead, and he has given us his spirit. And so when we pray, Lord, hear us, we know it doesn't fall on deaf ears. When we say, Lord, act, the Lord does act. And that might not look exactly what you're praying for, but the Lord always gives us what's best for us. And so maybe tonight we walk away with uh, an application tomorrow where it's, Lord, here's three ways that I adore you. Lord, here's two ways that I've fallen short. And each morning, just ask God to, to show up. And maybe it's one of those three. Lord, act. Lord, I need you to show up in my life. Or maybe it's Lord, forgive. Lord, I just need you to forgive. And, and we know he will. Or Lord, just hear me. And if you're just going through hard times and it's like, Lord, I don't even know what to pray. Lord, just hear me. May we be a people that pray like our lives depend on it every single morning. And we're going to see God, who's jealous for his name, show up here in Salt Company, show up in Dubuque, and across the nations. Will you guys pray with me? Lord, you are good. God, you are so, so good to us. And Lord, we boast in your faithfulness as we are not faithful, but Lord, you are always faithful to us. There's never been a day of our lives that you have not been faithfully pursuing us. And God, you are unchanging, and that's something we just rest in. Lord, we're, we're, so, we're so all over the place. We're so, um, yeah, God, unstable but we cling to you as our rock and our refuge. And as a body of people, we just say, Lord, we have fallen short. Lord, we need you. We have rebelled. Lord, we, we have put ourselves on the pedestal before you. And God, we ask you to come. Lord, would you meet us where we're at tonight? Lord, some people are just bring in heavy hearts. Lord, I pray that you would hear their cries. Lord, that you would be nearer to them than the skin on their, their body. Lord, that you would hear them. And Lord, some people are just praying that you would forgive. They, they come in with low to high grade guilt of things that have happened. And, and they just carry it. And Lord, I pray that you would forgive them. Lord, that you would take the weight off of their shoulders, that they don't have to carry it anymore but the yoke of Christ is easy and light. And God, we ask that you would act. Lord, that you would be jealous for your name amongst this people, amongst this church, amongst this city, amongst our campuses, amongst the the state of Iowa and to the ends of the earth. Lord, that you would act and you would show up and you would bring your kingdom. And, And God, you would use us as broken vessels to display the wonderful works of you, Lord. May your name be exalted, Jesus. We love you. Amen.